If you find yourself stuck in a self-destructive pattern of behavior, then what's the best way forward? Out or through? That's a question I've asked myself, both in the abstract and in a more personal context, more than once, and maybe it's something you can relate to too, or maybe it's something you've seen in your favorite fictional characters. Maybe you can't relate at all, but in any case, it is relevant to the main character of the book that I'm going to be looking at in this episode today, that is the character of Ladza, who's the narrator of Notes of a Crocodile by Chiu Miaojin. We, we might find along the way that Ladza and Chiu have some things in common. Uh, I won't be alone talking about this book, I'm sure you won't be surprised to know that. I'll be with uh, Connor Stewart, so a fellow Stewart, but his surname is spelt with a UA and I'm the EW. So I'll, I'll let you decide which, which spelling is superior. I, wouldn't like to, to judge that. Uh, before before we get on with the interview though, there's first, of course, the Trichofic news, the translated Chinese fiction news. It just, just three very light things uh, this time, and they're not exactly all hot off the press. Um, there's going to be links to all of them in the show notes. So one is a little article about a recent theatre production of Lu Xun's uh, Diary of a Madman, which I covered if you're a long-time listener, you will know, in the very first episode of this show. Um, so it is a Polish director that directed this play, and he seems to have expanded on the story a bit. So I don't know, it's just a fun thing to read. If you like Lu Xun, and if you're interested in that story, go check it out. Link is in the show notes. Uh, next thing, this is something perhaps a bit more substantive. Locus, who are, I believe they're a review site focused on science fiction, published the results of the 11th Chinese Nebula Awards. So um, it's a pretty handy resource. They've um, they've sought out those results in Chinese, translated them, published them in English. So if you're interested in Chinese sci-fi and you want to see who's uh, brought out the big sort of um, winner, winner stories, it's a terrible phrase, the big uh, hot pop, nope, acclaimed that's the word i'm looking for the big acclaimed stories then that is a little resource to check out again links in the show notes last of all now this is really not brand new news at all this is something i just i was looking for some cool recent zoom events to listen to when i'm when i'm working on youtube and i got one with the man himself david Dorway wang esteemed i believe he's a harvard scholar of chinese lit and it's all about the legacy of yu hua and it's an the it's it's a recorded zoom event it's an hour 12 minutes and 29 seconds long so if you're interested in yuhua who's we've still not covered on the main feed of the show shocked to say but if you're interested in yuhua or indeed uh, professor wang check that out link again is in the show notes or you you could just search it up i'm sure you can find it so yeah that that's the terrific news just a swift one let's cut the crap let's get right to my interview with connor stewart about notes of a crocodile Right, so on the show, we have Connor Stewart here to talk about Joe Miao Jin's Notes of a Crocodile. So first question, Connor, how's it going and what have you been up to? Hi, uh, uh, I'm Grant mostly. In Taiwan, it's been relatively normal. We've been having like big outdoor events and going to the beach and stuff like that. So I've been feeling a bit guilty in terms of family back home and people seeing me have fun and then feeling guilty for having fun. So it's been OK, far from that, but yeah. Yeah, it's funny. So earlier today, I was doing my interview uh, with Chitawe and Ari Heinrich uh, Tawe was saying that he gets a bit of FOMO uh, or worries that his life, there's not enough going on in his life when he looks at his social media, especially Instagram. And I don't quite get, I answered to him, like, I don't really get anything like that. But one thing that has driven me slightly insane is uh, seeing friends who are in countries that handled COVID properly, having nice, happy lives. Like before we hit record, we were talking about um, the Beijing coma episode. Um, my guest on that one was Ronald, who's over in Shanghai. And yeah, like you, he's been living a nice, normal, happy life for quite a long time now. And here I am in Dundee, still in lockdown. So envious of you. But uh, uh, envy aside, um, can you tell the listeners a wee bit about yourself and what you do? Yep. I'm from Belfast originally. Uh, and then I went to Leeds, University of Leeds, to study Chinese and Spanish. And then from uh, during that time, I spent a year in Beijing. And then from that, I went to Taiwan uh, to do, I had a MOFA, MOFA scholarship to do a year language. And then I ended up doing a master's degree in Taiwanese literature at National Taiwan University, 
where Cho Miao-jin also went, but not at the same time, obviously. Uh, after that, I spent some time working for newspapers here. And then I worked for an IP company doing media for them. And then eventually I, uh, I got a job with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Taiwan. So oh, wow. I'm doing kind of Facebook and uh, social media for them. Uh, just about my degree, uh, the thesis was on Wu Nianjian, so uh, theater. He did like a series of plays, but it was uh, very popular, popular kind of plays. Uh, on the side, I've done a bit of translation on my blog, mostly. Uh, I've translated stories for Ran Qinyue, Yi Ge Yin, uh, Wu Yiwei, and a few others. I did a, like a full-length novel for Yi Ge Yin, but it hasn't been published, but uh, it's on the back burner there somewhere. Which... Right, and we'll probably come back to this when we're doing the plugs at the end, but what's your website, uh, sorry, what's your blog's web address? Uh, translatingtaiwan.com. All right, so let's start with the crocodile, uh, proverbially speaking, who's holding the pen of this book, uh, Jo uh, Miao Jin herself. So first question about her, who was she, both as a person, and I guess who is she today as a figure on the literary landscape, or who was, uh -huh. who was she in her, when she was alive, who was she on the literary landscape? And then who is she today in, in Taiwan? Cho, Cho Mao Jin was uh, born in 1969 in Jianghua, uh, in the west of Taiwan. She had a pretty privileged childhood or a privileged, uh, well, what you could say in terms of Taiwan is privileged. She went to the first girls high school, which is the top female high school in uh, Taiwan. She went to Ta Taiwan National University, which is the top ranked university. She graduated from psych psychology department there in 1991. She worked as a counselor and a reporter. And then she made, uh, she went to France and she studied psychology there and then transferred to feminist studies, uh, studying under Hélène Sousseau, uh, a French thinker, a feminist thinker. And uh, in terms of the personal aspect, uh, she was a, a lesbian and she seems to have like dated openly and that seems to have been, her life seems to have been quite similar to, to what is portrayed in the, in, the, in the novel. Although not, we're not sure how exactly they overlap. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, there's a documentary by, uh, what's it by, by, let me see. Oh yeah, Evans Chan did a documentary on her and he had a lot of friends of her life uh, talking about her dating life and her self-harm uh and other aspects uh of her life yeah um in terms of who she is in the the literary landscape i think taiwan is unusual uh in the fact that le like lesbian or gay literature is quite mainstream if you were to pick two categories of literature here um major genres representing taiwanese literature the nativist literature might be one category and then modernist literature would be another one and that would incorporate a lot of queer literature. I was thinking about this when I was getting my Taiwan season that we're kicking off or helping to kick off with this episode. I was noticing that a lot of the literature uh, in translation that you could get from Taiwan, at least in English, was either somewhere in the queer or LGBT uh, scene or it was um, somehow connected with the um, indigenous people of Taiwan. And my um, cynical brain was like, is this just something that is translated because it um, ticks certain cultural interests of English speakers? Mm. Or is it um, because it sets it apart from mainland or other Chinese literature as sort of a unique selling point you know, for market reasons? Or if it casts cynicism aside, is this a fairly like representative sample of lit from Taiwan that's making it into English? And yeah, I, so I didn't, I didn't realize that, yeah, it's, um, it's not just that... Um, it's not what my cynical mind was imagining, that it's these very marginalized niche literatures that um, Western liberals basically are picking out. It's, it's nice to know, I guess, that they really are quite a salient feature. Yeah, it's interesting. Literature here is quite academic and a lot of people, I'm not, I'm not uh, throwing shade on Taiwanese people, like a lot of Taiwanese people read, but there's a gap between the, there's a gap maybe between what is academically acclaimed as with all, all countries, what's that academically acclaimed and what is uh, popular. Sure. So you get a lot of like romance fiction, uh, popular, like there's a lot of trashy novels, which probably don't get translated, but they're fun to read or so they don't always have those themes. But 
if you're talking about the ones that are taught in like Taiwanese literature, his, history of Taiwanese literature, there does seem to be yeah, uh, a lot of, I guess, gender tr transgression and a lot of uh, queer literature. Right. I think a little pet theory I developed and then was kind of saw confirmed across things I learned during this podcast was that uh, there was a huge number of readers in mainland China based on what I was seeing when I lived there. But a lot of them were maybe reading stuff on their phone, web fiction, um, be it beautiful literary creations or, I don't know, fan fiction or, or erotic fiction. I don't know. Um, and then I, I found that the answer to that suspicion was yes and no. Um, there is a lot of sort of silly... I don't know, I can't think of a better word for it than that. Very lowbrow stuff out there on the Chinese internet, but also some really um, awesome Chinese authors. Mainland Chinese authors got their start on like BBS uh, so forums and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, do you know if there's a similar story in Taiwan or do you have like just observation-based thoughts along those lines? There's a, a famous author here, Giddens Ko, I think he's called. Um, he made a start on PTT, I think, which is the, the Taiwanese bulletin board system version. But yeah, there is a lot of manga influence here. So a lot of people will be reading manga a lot from like Japanese translations or translations from Japanese. It's a, a heavy influence here. And then, yeah, there's a lot of web stuff. I'm not sure how much people get famous for that. I think a lot of the stuff that's online is more popular fiction whereas the people who get treated seriously uh, they have a certain style that they have to it's very you can actually see it in Chiu Miao Jin's work like the I can see like a typical way that Taiwanese writers write would be to use the framework of modernism so they have I think there's a lot of borrowing of like the James Joyce style of Virginia Woolf that kind of modernism and combining it with like very highbrow ways of expressing yourself in Chinese. Whereas for me, I think mainland fiction tends to be more direct, more easy to easy to read or easy to interpret for a, a foreign speaker. In, yeah. In my view, anyway. A, a word I quite liked that I've heard thrown around, I think I've thrown it around myself, is earthy. A lot of like a lot of the rural uh, a lot of rural settings a lot of suffering yeah it's fairly strong grounding in realism for the most part and then you know the the thing i'm covering up with the euphemism slightly is quite a lot of fecal stuff farting and stuff uh, which is not my favorite part of mainland chinese lit um uh -huh. but yeah uh, bring, bringing it back to chiu uh, miao jin um you mentioned her self-harm earlier and we kind of have to say it would be silly not to mention that she's she's not with us anymore she committed suicide at 26 um and notes of a crocodile um i don't believe i could be wrong here i don't think any any of the characters commit suicide but sort of d depression is is pretty uh, weighs pretty heavily in in the book do you think as readers because we we were saying before we started recording, that's basically what we both are. We're, we're really just readers. Um, as readers, do you think that Chiu Mao Jin's suicide should colour our reading? Or is it better just to focus on the text? There, there is actually uh, several references to suicide in the text. I, I went right. back over it today just to check. But So uh, Chu Kuang, he attempts suicide, and then right. Mang Sheng saves him. Mm -hmm. And then also, I think the... The sister of either, I think, Tun Tun's sister or Jiro's sister commits suicide by hanging. Like, she tries to, but she also fails. Right. But what I what I think, uh, it's always hard to take a, an author away from the work. Uh, and I think that some people are tempted to view Notes of a Crocodile and the Mark Motra book later as an extended suicide note. But I think that's kind of the wrong way to see Notes of a Crocodile. I'm not going to speak on Montmartre, but like in terms of Notes of a Crocodile, I think it's the wrong way to see the book as there's a layer of reflection, I think, in this book. And we get that with the, the crocodile thread. Like you can see that this isn't just a stream of consciousness of despair. There's it's planned in a way, like even you can see there's a, a better structure or like a, a more reflective structure than just uh, pouring out of 
whatever she was feeling at the time. Yeah. Uh, and I think that it's, uh, 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 sorry. I think that, yeah, there is a, a sense that suicide comes into the work in more ways than just direct references to it as well. Like two, two out of the four, she references four Japanese writers. Two of them died by suicide. Uh, Dazai and uh, Mishima mm. both killed themselves. I think there's a certain touch of the cult of suicide. I don't want to say it in that kind of term, but there is a, like, a cult around the almost a romanticization of suicide, which is quite common in uh, Taiwan. Like there's a, a recent film called The Sun. Uh, I think it was nom- it was uh, almost I think it was nominated for for the Oscars maybe or maybe not. But uh, basically, it had a character who was completely superfluous to the plot, and he committed suicide. But it was in a very glorified way. And I think this kind of like rejection of society. Uh, can get mixed in with the existential uh, elements of the novel. So you can conflate existentialism and suicide, but I think it's not a wise thing to do. And we should look at the existential things for themselves and not, you don't need to to read the conclusion of her death because the death is caused by whatever mental anguish or suffering she was going through. And you don't necessarily know uh, right. who, what, if that is, She's just representing a character in the, and we don't know how close that is to her own character. So it's not useful, I think, yeah. to her art. Yeah. And it kind of like, it makes her art a bit cheap or cheaper than it should be. I think you should like give it a bit more credit in terms of artistry than just chalking it down to an extended suicide note, really. Yeah, I mean, t- to be really inappropriate, it's probably when it comes to Chou Miao Jin and her suicide, Remember, it's probably a good idea to remember the death of the author, not not her death, but the theory that says, look, you really don't know what the author intended. Um, mm. you, you, but, you know, you are the meaning maker. It's your reading that determines the meaning of the text. Um, so as you were talking, a few things popped into my head. One was, yeah, you're right. The prevalence of kind of not suicide, but suicidal characters. And maybe I think the thing, the way I was thinking of, of, of that, um vibe in the book when i was reading is like self-destruction uh, the narrator yeah. the main character is pretty self-destructive and kind of wallows in it as as we can as, as people there's a certain sort of um maybe not masochistic but like grim pleasure sometimes in behaving consciously behaving ag- against your own best interests either because you think you deserve it or because you're getting some kind of short-term rush um and yeah and there's there's a few characters i should have written down everyone's name but there's the male character the like the really Meng Sheng. Meng Sheng. Meng Sheng. Meng Sheng. yeah he's like self-destruction um sort of embodied he's maybe the most extreme example of that but i think it's there in a lot of the characters i have speaking of like like the existential um the, ex- the fact you raised ex- existentialism um i like that for, for two reasons one it's it's a word I'm always trying to bring up on the show. I think it's it's proof, <laughs> it's proof pretty fruitful for me in reading stuff from from the mainland. I, uh-huh. I I couldn't really say exactly what it is. I mean, maybe all literature is just quite existential, but I found that's quite a good way or an, yeah, fruitful a fruitful way for me to read. You know, everything from Lu, Lu Shun to um, the Yuzhu Shin, it worked for me. But um, existentialism, it's um, it's a nice framework, I think, because it can it can um, it can give you optimism and it really powerful optimism, and it can give you the absolute depths of pessimism on the verge of nihilism. And I think that's something notes the notes of a crocodile can do. So I've got two quotes here: one's from near the start, one's from near the end, and I think it sums up like what I think where the book how the book deals with sort of optimism and pessimism from from my point of view. So this is the quote from near the start. And this might agree with what you were saying about the modernist, like stream of consciousness, consciousness writers. So yeah, here we go. Humanity stabs a bayonet into a baby's chest. Fathers produce daughters that they pull into the bathroom to rape. Handicapped midgets drag themselves onto highway overpasses to announce that they're about to end it all just to collect a little spare change. And mental patients have irrepressible hallucinations and suicidal urges. How can the world be this cruel? A human being only has so much in them. And yet you must learn through experience until you finally reach the maddening conclusion that the world wrote you off a long time ago. Or accept the prison sentence that your crime 
is your, your crime is your existence. And the world keeps turning as if nothing had happened. The four smiles on the faces of the lucky ones say it all. It's either this or getting stabbed in the chest with a bayonet, getting raped, dragging yourself onto the highway overpass, or checking into a mental, in- mental institution. So like, it's about as black as you can possibly imagine. It's really bleak. I mean, the, the line about your crime is your existence, I suppose that could be a reference to... Um, being an uh, LGBT person in Taiwan. But the reading that jumps out to me is that like existing is just hard as hell. It's an existential perspective. So that's near the start. And how could, you know, how could anything possibly pick up? But near the end, there's a section that spoke to me just as much. um, But I thought it was really kind of, it's not cheerful, but I found it very optimistic the same way that, I don't know, the stuff stuff out there you can read from Albert Camus is optimistic. So it's, Mm. This is the start of a chap- a short chapter called Death Experience Number One. So sounds not very cheerful, but this is it. A certain part of me has died as I've learned to leave behind the qualities of my youth, the over-anxiousness, over-sensitivity and self-consciousness, not to mention arrogance and idealism that diminish with life experience. I was a late bloomer, but at long last, I lost my innocence. Um, like anyone else when they're young, I harbored lofty expectations, but lacked the self-knowledge to com- comprehend my own passions and vices. So like that, that's near the end of the book. And the feeling I kind of got is through this book, um, Lads, the, the narrator, kind of chills stand in, goes through the absolute ringer. And it's in some, I think in some ways, it's the ringer of becoming an adult, but also compounded on top of that, she's a lesbian coming out of the closet, at least on a personal level, she's coming to terms with herself and meeting other um, queer people. Um, but yeah, I, by the end of it, I got the sense that this character was probably not going, like in, in my mind anyway, as Lads gets older, Lads is probably going to become a fairly well put together person who's not going you know maybe i'm maybe i'm being too judgmental here but it seems like lads is on a road to being fairly mentally healthy or if not mentally healthy functional um so i don't i think if i read the book and you asked me where do you think this offer went in their life i'd probably say oh she um probably is okay now so it's all the more sad that um for me anyway that Chiu Jin's Miao Jin's not with us anymore because it seemed at the end of, at the end of things not a cheerful book but a book about getting better that was quite a long spiel. No, no, I, I, I wanted to address a few points you brought up. Mm. Uh, I had like mixed feelings about the book. I started to dread like having to read. Like re- when I was re- doing the reread, like I read it a long time ago, but rereading it, I started to dread like, oh, I'm going to be, I'm going to be at the, uh, the beck and call of this emotional <laughs> uh, woman, like just playing with my emotions. But I do, I think that's, part of that was me seeing a bit of myself in her and the struggle when when you're uh, coming to terms with yourself whether you're gay or not or whatever you are in the world it's still uh when you're growing up you you become a different person and I think that the if you try to re- if you're repressing a part of yourself the logic that you start to create gets completely uh muck, mucked up like completely crazy and right. i think a lot of that what you what you're talking about the self-destructiveness is that like faulty logic working in her head like like you see the consistent pattern and she sees the consistent pattern that she's doing she pursues people pursues them until they need her and they want to rely on her and then at that moment she pulls away and says oh actually like I don't need your drama in my life, which is like, she's been making promises of like forever love, but for her, it makes sense because she's saying, I need to pull away from you before I get hurt. Because if you start to love me, then this will become real. And then we'll have a, I'll have something real to lose. And from the documentary, it seems that this is actually like a pattern that Cho Miao-jin herself had in her relationships. She was cutting her wrists and apparently there was a, a scar on her wrist from each relationship she'd had. Mm-hmm. And she, the last relationship before she, she decided to take her own life was the one that she got left first. So in every other relationship, she'd been the one to leave. And then in the final one, it's when, but the, the, yeah, the, the angst that you, you described, like to some extent I could identify with it. Um, there was a poet, uh, in the documentary who described the, I thought 
she described it quite well, that the book is kind of shameless, shameless and it's pouring out of like the, it, it's shameless kind of in several ways, it's shameless in the, the way it pours out uh, suicide, I like ideation, it has like the lesbian aspect, it's just, she's not being ashamed of any of the parts of her to, she's confiding all this to the, the reader. And I think that that, what the poet in the documentary was saying that it's like she is living the hysteria that is the the stereotype of woman, like the hysterical woman or like uh, embodying that in a text. But I, yeah, I, I got irritated. At, I saw like a quote that you messaged, you messaged me in one of the questions you sent me earlier. She talks about herself a lot. She makes the criticisms that anyone would make of her book herself in the book. Yeah. So she calls herself monotonous. She's, she goes on about how she's droning on about things. And then she actually, she finds the solutions to all the problems that she has, but she doesn't apply them. And she gives like really great advice to Zhuo and to Tun Tun, but she doesn't take it. And you can see like the, that that's part of that logic of self-destruction that you're, you're talking about as well, I think. I know we were talking about modernism earlier. But um, I think there's quite a few postmodern things you could point to in this book and like the whole self-awareness to the point of ridiculousness thing. So I'm thinking of like, there was a certain, when I was younger, I used to really like it when, um, like as a kid, I think, or a teenager, I used to really enjoy it when a movie or a cartoon or a show would call attention to the fact that it was a movie or a cartoon or breaking the fourth wall. Yeah, 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 basically. Yeah. Or more, more subtle stuff, but especially breaking the fourth wall and I think when I got older, I got a bit more choosy about that because say, for example, a character in said, let's call it a film would say, well, this is, this narrative is ridiculous. There's, look, there's a plot hole. How do you explain that? And then you, the viewer are supposed to be like, oh, yeah, really funny. Yeah. But, but at the same time, it's like, hang on a minute. You're just, you're just being yeah. lazy. <laughs> you're, you're writing a little postmodern cultural wave for a cheap, a cheap laugh that lets you off the hook for other problems that uh you know a committed modernist would recognize as genuine problems but um it's weird i i could see that a lot of the criticisms of of, of the book and like i'm yeah like i said there i'm i'm pretty no longer so into i'm i'm pretty jaded when it comes to sort of postmodern playfulness or writers kind of making excuses for themselves by preempting their critics but i didn't really get fed up with um the narrator i think maybe just to be honest, because she's quite miserable. And I like it when fiction sort of acknowledges how miserable it can be to be alive, because a lot of it doesn't. Um, mm. But I could I could see why it would get tiresome, because it is, it is pretty intense or over the top at points. With LGBT writing, there's been such a focus on misery for so long. Right. But I think that not, if you're in the LGBT community and... So we've had waves, like there's been the... I think Show Miao Jin is maybe in the, the part of the gay movement, which was like a, a rejection of heteronormativity and a bit more transgressive. Like, and she, she didn't see herself ever being accepted. But if you look at contemporary Taiwan, the majority of the gay community here now, we got gay marriage passed. It's far closer to heteronormativity now, like the way that the gay community want to be seen compared to the more radical history of the gay movement, which is, it, it's a very short history, like the, the gay movement here, but it's very interesting in that the movement itself is a lot more radical than the majority of the, the people within the, the community. Like, because with the gay community, you, I guess it's a lottery of who gets born and in which situation, but it's interesting that I think that if Chum Miao Jin was alive maybe two decades later, I wonder would she still be as transgressive or would she like be a middle-aged woman who like has like three babies with another one? Like <laughs> it's interesting to me, like how much of it is the LGBT angst and how much of it is actually actually just mental illness, like or yeah, mental something because I not all like I was reading a, another book recently called uh, Grandma's Girlfriends, which is about old, like a older, like a much older generation of 
of gay women in Taiwan and how they like of different classes as well and how they uh, went about their lives, but they didn't have this massive depression or angst. So I think to some extent, you, we can't really conflate the being in the closet with as much as I might have experienced some of what Miao Jin or uh, Cho Miao Jin went through. I don't think it explains it all. And there is an aspect of, because I think we, we get obsessed with putting it in queer literature and putting in the framework of she was a queer writer, she was a lesbian writer, but she's also representing the traditions of like Osamu Dazai and the Kobo. And she, she references other traditions and she sees herself as being a, in that tradition, not as a, a queer writer. She didn't even associate very much with the queer movement in Taiwan according mm. to the documentary so um, I'm lucky enough to have uh, read um, one of Osama Dazai's books um, uh, No Longer Human, this is available in translation so I read the English version as an ebook, and yeah I, I really enjoyed it and it reminded me of some of the possibly the very first translated East Asian lit I read long before I was yeah long before I knew I was going to be spending any time in that part of the world. I read um, In the Miso Soup by Ryu Murakami. Someone I think might have accidentally shelved it on the teen fiction shelves at my local borders, <laughs> which is a mistake. Um, but I, th- I, th- I think I knew what Miso Soup was and I liked the cover. And yeah, it was this extremely like intense, violent, quite existential, weird story. And then I've read some more of his books since and I've read a few Chinese authors who remind me of him, like the um like Murong Shui Sun and um maybe maybe not so much Wang Shua, but these a few of these authors who do these very bleak, morally uh-huh. transgressive, existential, strange, often quite short, fast paced stories with a lot of indulgence, um, yeah, self destruction. And then this one, I could see this one fitting in, in that tradition. I don't know if that tradition has a name, but it's yeah, it's a it's something I've I encountered reading Japanese stuff in translation and Chinese stuff in, in translation. And now I guess Taiwanese stuff in translation. And yeah, I think for me, it, I enjoyed reading the book through that sort of reference point as well as the, the uh, queer literature. They both seem to work. I don't know what I would call that tradition though. Is there, is there a name for it? I, I don't know. Um, I think there probably is, but I, I don't have it on me. But <laughs> um, what you were saying about, the differences in the like activism or the queer culture back then and now so how back in in chill's chill's time there wasn't i guess there wasn't much accommodation with laws or mainstream society so there wasn't a, things weren't being framed in terms of like marriage sort of normative ways of having relationships so there was the radicalism and then in taiwan today i don't i don't know so much but i've in a little bit of reading for this season yeah i've learned some of the radicalism yeah the, the the radicalism is now sort of perhaps coming up at odds against the less radical More progressive hate. visions i don't know if there's conflict but yeah there's the question of okay once you have gay marriage mission accomplished or have you just been sort of subsumed in a way well there there, there is a an interesting point there in that the first marriage bill the first pro- proposed marriage bill was not a uh, uh, a normal marriage bill. It was a diverse families bill, oh. which would have made any number of you could have gotten any number of people becoming a family. So you could have three partners or four or four partners mm. registering as a family, and that got rejected because it was too radical. Right. Another point is that the the gay pride parade reportedly this is what was reported in the media anyway, which is all I know. Apparently, the organizers wanted to include be more inclusive of the leather and drug chem chem sex community right and i think somebody put that on a post in in the pride group whether it was intentional by the organizers or not it was reported in the media that there was uh people were trying to make it i guess like a For adult to bring something from the margins of the gay community like or things that are perceived as negative within the gay community, like uh, chemsex or BDSM, and take them to the... But I think at that point, there was a lot of pushback by the more heteronormative or... I'm not saying heteronormative in a bad way, but people who are 
try to live their lives normally and the take it easy crowd. Yeah, or log uh, log cabin Republicans, but the yeah, Tony's very yes. Um, yeah. So the other thing you said that sort of ties into that is like, yeah, what what um what would it have been like if Joe was like our age living in, in this decade and this is i always try and bring up this uh, tv show on my podcast did you ever watch or hear about a show called mr robot yeah uh-huh. did you watch it yeah well not to spoil anything too much but do you remember near in the end uh, the character white rose who's a, a a trans woman who in basically needs to keep keep her um her male and female personas separate because society the society she's in you know it hasn't been accepted or or at least in her early years that kind of bifurcation happened because there was no way to to reconcile her trans identity with what how she could live her life but then we see a glimpse of a sort of a better world and i won't i really can't spoil that too much but we see a much happier um, white rose who hasn't become the main villain of the show um, is just living her life as a, as, a, as a woman so it's not just that she's not the bad guy anymore it's that all the really dark the ang- angry side of her character is not there anymore and I'm quite sympathetic to the idea that a lot of the things we consider mental illness are a product not just of a flaw in ourselves but we're they're determined by our conditions be it our material conditions or the society we're in so yeah the fact that what am I trying to say yeah if if Cho was our age born in um the more modern taiwan it makes complete sense to me that she might have lived a really different and perhaps from a literary perspective less interesting life because that those pressures weren't there i almost think that you're still like that that kind of like point of view like very similar to a lot of my classmates in in my class in taiwan i had a lot of people who were obsessed with uh yuan Zhisheng and Cho Miao-jin, both of which committed suicide, both of whom committed suicide. But what I almost think is that like people are conflating, conflating depression and creativity, whereas I think depression is actually a sapper of creativity in, a, in many ways. And I think it's like an sure. unfortunate, I think it almost inc- like, I had a classmate who wouldn't go and get her depression treated because she felt it was tied to her creativity. But it's just like, I don't, want her to live that life just to yeah it's a dangerous it's a dangerous assumption to work on isn't it yeah yeah i, I think you're right yeah de- um depression isn't exactly a energizing or mobilizing force what i think anger can be though or frustration i've certainly like, i've done a little bit of creative writing here and there and for me anyway it's not i mean it's not it's maybe not the strongest motivation for making me want to write um excitement is probably the best one but like for a runner up, I might choose frustration or anger. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's my problem. Uh, um, I think we've probably talked about um, the author herself enough. Probably a good idea to get onto the story now. Um, yeah. So I guess first we can just quickly try and summarize what it's about. I think I think I read this one recently enough. I'll, I'll give it a shot. And then if you think I've yeah. missed anything yeah. really um, crucial, I'll, I'll, we, we'll, we can include that. So we're following uh, at first an unnamed author as she, I guess, has just let she's just left home or she's left the girls' school she was at, and she's off to study Chinese lit at Taiwan's top university. It is psycho- oh, oh, it's Chinese lit. Oh yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, the one <laughs> the one detail I remember. Um, and she finds she has a crush on I think one of her her classmates who's a little bit older than her just a couple of years older than her i think and they get into a relationship which forms that pattern you described gets it gets a little bit um fraught after progressively more fraught after a st- having started out it's quite a sweet relationship and that takes up like i think maybe the first third of the book um because i remember the, the blurb i think sort of frames it as she is part of this group a very diverse group of um queer characters but i think they only sort of come to the fore maybe in the middle section of the book mm-hmm. and this main character sort of has to wrestle with a lot of her own problems that her first relationship ends she has another sort of affair with a considerably older woman the the dynamic is essentially the older woman is sort of living a double life she has a straight relationship with a man her own age which is pretty dysfunctional 
and she ends up opting for that life over um, staying with our narrator. And then I think our narrator finally has some kind of reconciliation with her first, her first love. And then we end, I think, on a sort of a hopeful note. But what I've missed out is interspersed in little episodes, we see a less realistic narrative about this crocodile or this, what is it, a crocodile who's trying to wear a human suit, just sort of having these little episodes in some kind of parallel version of daily life where like she goes around or it's not gendered, it's an it, isn't it? It goes around um, like stroking fur coats in shops or buying cream puffs. And it's very sort of cute and peculiar and a bit more experimental. And while that's going on in this strange mirror narrative, there's lots of snippets of radio and TV, uh, Taiwanese media, where there's all sorts of crazy speculation about who these crocodiles are. And there seems to be a mixture of like genuine curiosity and fondness, and then an urge to like police the crocodiles. And then it all ends, and it's kind of a humorous, humorless, uh, humorously <laughs> contrasted with the crocodile's life, which is like boring, sort of like lying around, nothing very frightening. And then at the end, the crocodile sort of shyly reveals itself to the the nation. So that, I mean, the reading, reading of that seems fairly easy. Um, it's, I guess it would be Taiwan, post-martial law Taiwan, coming to terms with the existence of um, queer people, I guess, um, who are coded as crocodiles. Have I missed anything? Uh, just the... Uh... Not that important, but the Jiro, like the Jiro and Tun Tun and then Mengshen and Chu Kuang's relationship are like kind of side. Oh yeah, side uh, side pieces, I guess. Uh, yeah, in the little group of friends that uh, the narrator, who we find out gets nicknamed Ladza, becomes a part of. There is a fairly dysfunctional gay male relationship, and there is a more wholesome but also sort of flawed um, female uh, lesbian relationship, and. Uh, Laz has different interactions with these four different people um, and yeah I really should have remembered their names but the, the two girls are Tun Tun and Jiro and Tun Tun and the two guys are Meng Sheng and Chu Kuang Chu Kuang yeah yeah they're pro I don't think they figure too much in the plot but they're interesting figures thematically yeah what I thought was interesting is the, the there was like a parallel for me between uh, you know Crystal Boys by by Shen Yong, the it's like one of the the main uh, gay novels in Taiwan. It recently they did like a a musical version of it in in Chiang Kai Shek Memorial Hall. It was uh, or the concert hall. It was really good. But there's a pair in there who are kind of a mythology mythological pair in the the idiot the two idiot park and they have this violent relationship and one kills the other right and i thought it was interesting the way like it always seemed because there's also been like a lot of media speculation about violence in same-sex partnerships in taiwan right and there was a, a statistic the other like uh from 2019 they said like that 90 percent of people in same-sex relationships don't report violence of their partners or something but there seems to be like a focus on violence in gay relationships in a way. Like Chu Kuang, is, if we're to believe Meng Sheng stabbed him in the chest. And there's a lot of that kind of, I thought it was interesting. I mean, even uh, Cho Miao Jin, like even the, I mean, not uh, lads, I think there's also like, if not physical violence, there's psychological violence there or psychological harming of the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, the thing about the the Chu Huang and um, Meng Sheng, like the scene when they're introduced as a as a couple, it, like they're brawling, if I remember right, and there's ref uh -huh. continued references to their like battles with each other, and I was like, oh, this is um this is a depiction, I can't think of any depiction of a ma male gay couple in media or fiction or films, I've seen that's like that, um, unless you're counting something like Point Break or something. Well, there, there's a recent film, there's a recent film uh, came out in Taiwan. Uh, what's it called again? Sorry, can I, can I just Google it quickly? I forgot what the name was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wrote a review of it, but it was basically the, like, it was very rapey kind of in there. Mm. Your name engraved herein. And so this is uh, also filmed 
just as I think it was filmed. It, it wasn't filmed. It was uh, set when I think Chang Xingguo died. So when would that be? And 19, 1988, I think. And so the relationship between the two guys was very stalkerish and unpleasant and involved force, forced, forced, I guess, sexual pleasure. And it's funny how a lot of it, it's been interpreted largely as a romantic film. Whereas when you look at it from a modern, I think a modern perspective or from my perspective anyway, it seemed very, not very nice or not, not sweet, not interesting. Like a psychological thriller, more like more than a romance story. If it's that dark. Yeah, but the way it's seen or interpreted in Taiwan is more focused on the positive and that, oh, they were they were sweet. It could have been, but they because of the times they didn't get to be. So I think there's like a lot of uh, a lot of because people are are repressed in that era, then we sweep a lot under the under the carpet about what is appropriate and what is acceptable behavior like yeah um it may i mean i maybe this is a really misinformed perspective but the thing i noticed or i, I was thinking as i was reading about these two couples so chu kuang and meng Sheng, and then they're sort of they're not really a mirror image but the the lesbian couple um tun tun and juro although i think one of them is specified as being like the more masculine one and one is the more feminine one they're both pretty girly or, or at least yeah. they're described as being quite feminine and then the two guys are i mean one of them i think is described as being more macho but they're basically both quite Very masculine, <laughs> aggressive yeah. masculine edgy guys who like to fight and ride around on motorcycles and i don't know it doesn't i mean i it's not like it's not like that's something i've never um seen in real life or seen in media or it's not some. It's something I can get my head around, but it wasn't what I was expecting. And uh, it's interesting that you're saying that's there's other sort of examples of that in st- like fiction or, or media in, in Taiwan. I because like I'm I'm trying to think on stuff I've seen or read from mainland China. I mean, there's I guess there's just not very much. I do remember seeing this rather strange film set in Xiamen, a mainland Chinese film about a gang of male criminals. And it seems like they've kidnapped a child, but then you mm-hmm. find out near the end that actually they just wanted to sort of raise a basically a queer family. But it was like this is a very strange, <laughs> like given given what's allowed to be made in mainland China, this is a weird thing. Yeah, there's actually a there's actually a, a recent uh, gay series. It was a, based on a, a series of novels called Addiction. Uh, it got. It got de- it got taken off the shelves in mainland China eventually, but it it aired long enough for it to become a quite a mainstream hit. But it was like very similar in that they were both very masculine characters, and there was a little bit of that's pretty much rape, dude. In it, like uh, it's like you can't tie someone up and then like it be love whenever you like you have sex with them enough. So that it becomes love, like is the logic of it, like kind of. But yeah, yeah, I'm not sure how healthy that, that is for. But it seems to be popular in the BL category of uh, a boys love category of man- like manga slash romance novel. Uh, yeah, that seems like something that we might accept if it's like in Game of Thrones with Daenerys and Khal Drogo. But yeah, in a modern setting, it, yeah. So. But I think the. The idea of forbidden love, like that was so prevalent in this era. A lot of things get conflated that maybe you would, if it was a normal, if it was a straight, uh, I said normal, oops, a straight relationship, you wouldn't be, uh, you wouldn't be as forgiving of certain things. But I I get what you mean, because I think that like the point that I, I, the point that I think you were almost making there was that in our general perception of Taiwanese relationships or even gay relationships all around the world, there's an idea that there's a more masculine one and a more feminine one. So you get that in stuff like Modern Family or... Right. And that was to some extent... uh, It's a bit normative. A very common thing in Taiwan among lesbians. So you get this like T versus the Po uh, in in Taiwanese lesbian relationships. 
And so the T was more tomboy or masculine, and then the Po was more feminine. So that has been a structure in Taiwanese relationships for a long time. But then, yeah, so in this book, although the main character and Shui Ling seem to have that kind of relationship. Yeah, that's quite clear. There is, quite, yeah. there is the side piecing of this other relationship, which is which is two feminine girls, although they both end up being straight in the end, or I guess living their lives as straight people in the end. Yeah, there's a lot to a lot to chew on. And I might it might pop up later, depending on how I frame some of my other questions. Um but speaking of questions, getting back on track, here's another one I, I got written down. It's just about the I the engagement with ideas in the book that it's a it's a pretty cerebral book so we already mentioned there's some direct reference there's a lot of like name dropping of um authors i remember lots of name dropping of like fiction authors like we were saying the various japanese authors murakami's in there as well which just goes to show how how long he's been a big deal in, in outside of his own country and i might i might call back here to the interview i mentioned having done earlier today um with the membranes because the membranes also is I think it's even more prolific in its name dropping, um, and it it name drops uh, nonfiction like Judith Butler and stuff as well as fiction. And I I don't remember if if Notes of the Crocodile name drops any nonfiction, but there's like an engagement both with there's there's mm. intellectual ambitions and also sort of intertextual ambitions. Do you do you have anything you can say at that? Because I'm I'm kind of struggling here to make a point. I think that. This is very, very common in Taiwan, like Taiwan literature. If you read one book, you feel you have to read like about 25 books to actually understand what the point they were making. And I think it goes, basically, I think it's all James Joyce's fault. Because <laughs> like, James Joyce is like did, um, a deliberate attempt to be, uh, um, how do you say that word again? Uh, erudite, I guess. Mm. And to make references, obscure references to like James Joyce is famous for it in his later work anyway. And I think that caught on in Taiwan and became off the mode. So you see it in Notes of a Desolate Man as well by Chu Tian Wen. Like that book is just full of references to other books and other things. And then you've got Wang Wenxing, who is like another famous writer who wants you to read his book. He famously said he wanted you to read it one character at a time and spend like time analyzing this character then move on to the next and it's like a lot of energy to expend on the book uh and i think it takes away from the readability of it like if you have to constantly make references to outside the frame of the book and then maybe so if you have to take a break every time to read a book it, it's going to take up a lot of your time but yeah i don't think it's necessarily something i like about the the story i think that yeah, you can make references to ideas without having to drop the name. Mm. And then it becomes a bit more interesting because you've engaged with the idea as opposed to trying to just show off your scholarly knowledge. Like if you've, be, if you've the Taiwanese literature classes that I took, we had a heavy focus on modernism. So Judith Butler was there, all the like literary theory and criticism. So Taiwanese people are very definitely engaged with literary theory from the West. Uh, so I'm not surprised that that kind of thing crops up because if you're a scholarly person like Cho Miao-jin was, then that's the, the way that students at NTU get on. Like, that's how they are anyway. But... Right. Well, I'm glad we can pin that all in James Joyce and pernicious Irish influence <laughs> on Taiwan, sorted. Um, I was going to say, I guess, two things to play devil's advocate slightly or trying to add something. One is without those name droppings of like Osamu at Desai and Mishima and, and, and Murakami, we maybe wouldn't have had the conversation about them and the existential themes. So I think, yeah, a name dropping is definitely often used as a sort of a pat on the back, sort of a way to hand yourself some cultural currency. But the the way that an in, like an intertextual link has can function like a web link, it steal something almost from whatever you're referencing so it can be fruitful but yeah i think if you, you can overdo it definitely and how much 
how, whether or not it's overdone, I guess, is subjective depending on the reader. Like I was a bit more, I was think I was more tolerant of it than you, but I could also sense she was approaching my tolerance limit. And if she crossed it, I might have got fed up and read the book much more slowly. I, li- I liked it a bit more the way she dealt with Kobo than the way she dealt with the other ones. I liked the engagement with the crocodile mm. and uh, like the, I like the fake ones better than the real ones a lot. Like the Genet stuff being a, a crocodile, that crossing over into the crocodile world. And like, maybe because I am, like I read a bit of Genet, so I, I knew the kind of reference, but I think the, yeah, it did get a bit much, but it's like, I don't mind if you use it, but you, you give, you give me some of what they have, but there wasn't much. It was just a, a name drop the crocodile yeah. of it. like you give like give me a present or something and i'll give you this from him so it wasn't really used so much i think yeah it's like if you um if you don't know what it, the reference is to then it's it's wasted on you it's just going to alienate you and um, the other thing i was going to say is um one possible explanation for why this name dropping so big in taiwan beyond just sort of cynical trying to show off and climb up the, the ladder of prestige I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I, I hope oh, that Taiwan doesn't think that I think they're like that. I love you, Taiwan. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, the ministers are, are going to descend on, on both of us. Um, no, what I mean is like um, a reason, an explanation of all the name dropping that I read actually in Ari Heinrich's intro to the membranes was that Taiwan in the eighties and nineties after the, um, after martial law was lifted um, had a bit of a, mass influx of foreign culture and this is something i don't know much about i know it in the mainland chinese context in the 80s with um gaga kaifang um, reform and opening so suddenly all this western and other but especially all the western culture comes flooding in and it becomes cool to walk around in your jeans eating um eating french fries and like i I don't know how much i guess you probably would know about this but like a thing that interested me was on the show when i covered a uh, flock of brown birds, Hussa Niao Chun by, oh no, what's his name? <gasps> oh, God damn it. Oh, Gufei, Gufei. Um, that was a very sort of Freudian, like pre World War II modernist sort of surreal story, but written in 80s China. And the reason was that was all the stuff that Chinese, mainland Chinese literati were devouring, was this stuff that is really to my liking, but they were maybe, they were giving you like, they were writing it in a much more, well, yeah, in the 80s, in a much more modern time. So in a way, they were doing the sort of dreamy, surreal 1930s, 40s thing, but in a way that might be even more intelligible to a modern person, even though it's in China, because it's just, it's just, it's got that lag in time, which uh-huh. was only exists because of censorship, basically, national boundaries, delaying the entry of these or suppressing the entry of these literatures into China. Um, so I don't know if Taiwan had a similar thing where, you know, there was this martial law um, dam and mm-hmm. then suddenly the dam bursts and then you have for a decade a massive flourishing and intertextual surge. Uh, do, do, like, I really don't know much about that. Do you, do you know much about that? Um, not, beyond, not beyond that, really. Like the, I know that definitely during the martial law period, there was a lot of People forget that actually Taiwan equally had quite suppressive rules about censorship and what was allowed, but I, I can't really go into much detail beyond that. I know that there are certain certain books were banned and they were they had like haircuts had to be like boys had to have short hair and girls had to have lo- uh, long hair. But beyond that, I I'm not super sure. Like uh, there's a few documentaries about the que- like the queer movement when it got started in Taiwan. And the first few pride parades, which were interesting, but that was well after uh, martial law had been lifted. So yeah, I think this is. I mean, I'm going to go into um, conspiracy theorist tanky mode for a minute. Um, my feeling is that as Westerners, these things are they're, th- these things aren't. We're not given lies, but we're sort of we're led to believe that during the Cold War, any country that was on the side of the West must have been a liberal democracy. So like mm. some so like I think my default assumption was okay North Korea South Korea one's with the Allies one is in the you know the is one of the the red communist countries oh so therefore North Korea must have been the same sort of dictatorship mm. it is now 
South Korea must have been the free democratic country that it is today. And then I read a book on Korea and I was like, oh, no, not true at all. And to, like it lines up from what I remember, it line, its period of opening up lines fairly evenly with mainland China's um, the eighties, not obviously China's mm. not a democracy now, but there's a parallel. And then um, learning about Taiwan, I was like, oh, right. Okay. So it didn't just become a democracy as soon as it um, got split off from the mainland. Not at all. It's like a similar story. But funnily enough, even uh, even Ireland has a, like a, a similar enough story with the right. the power that the Catholic Church had in Ireland, right up until quite uh, quite recently. Like it's it, it's it's funny. Like what you say that. Like I agree I agree with you. Like that we simplify things in our mind and the the bodies and the goodies kind of. So. Totally. Um, I think yeah. So you, I should mention Scotland. Like I think a lot of Scottish people don't. I mean, I didn't know this and I still don't have a very clear view, but like pre 80s Scottish politics was very different to what it became. I know that people used to call the Scottish National Party the Tories in kilts. And they were, and, and I think that from, from what I'm, as far as I'm aware, the, the Conservative Party was more of a presence in Scotland right up until poll tax, um, which sort of ushered in like the the purge, the purge of, of, of um, the Tories in Scotland. and more or until recently the status quo that i grew up in but yeah if no one tells you what came before the status quo then even if no one lies to you your assumptions are gonna sort of fill in the blanks wrongly yeah i was gonna say um i had a bit of an a a thing that sort of opened my eyes to some history but also gave me a clearer view of some differences between modern taiwan and modern china um the one time i visited taiwan i was in taipei and it just so happened one of the places i visited was a park where some some I think government killing of protesters. Two two eight. Two two eight. Think, pretty it's sure. February twenty eighth yeah. incident. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, I wandered into that park and visited the museum or read the signs. You know, and it was a Mandarin speaking country, but something like that would be inconceivable in like Tiananmen Square. It's interesting for two reasons. That park. Mm. Uh, so the massacre in nineteen forty seven. I think it was. But uh, regardless, that is actually the setting for Bai Xian Young's Crystal Boys. So that park is very queer. And that, that's the new park. So that's where a lot of, Oh, shit. Earthquake. Okay. It's gone. Is that a real earthquake? earthquake. <laughs> Bloody hell. Are you okay? Oh, yeah. I can see you. For listeners, um, the, there's a fish tank behind Connor's head and I can see the water. Swaying. I got an earthquake alert, but yeah, it's fine. Bloody hell. <laughs> yeah, there's something you wouldn't have to deal with in Scotland or Ireland. Um, sorry, I, I lost your, I lost <laughs> my tagger. <laughs> um, you were talking about uh, Bai Xinyong's Crystal Boys oh, yeah. Park. Oh yeah, so that was where the Crystal Boys was set. So people were, queer people would go to that park, and they still do, like, uh, occasionally, not me, uh, to find partners and to hook up in the toilet apparently but uh so yeah that's like a big but what i was going to say about the the 228 incident is that taiwan has a set up a like a transitional justice commission and so with taiwan they're reflecting their emphasis the government in fact is emphasizing the change from military uh, from the uh what's it called uh, from the military watch? I forgot. Yeah, so the Transitionary, Transitionary Justice Commission is emphasizing the change from the dictatorship of Chiang Kai-shek to democratic Taiwan, which is what they judge as, uh, I think, the Li, Li, Li Tonghui's second term. But, but yeah, it's interesting that a park can take on two different, completely different uh, identities in mm. reference to the, the queer uh, culture. So Bai Shen Yong's work was being published in the 70s and 80s, even though it was like really gay in its themes. And I thought that was odd because that was still during martial law. And yet he could publish that and it's fine, but he didn't identify as a gay person, as a right. gay author, which is, but I think that goes back to the novel, like the, 
everybody worrying about being perceived as a crocodile, but being interested. Oh, aftershock. It's funny, coming through on my headphones, it just kind of sounds like someone tapping their feet, but I can see the water swaying behind you. Oh, Jesus, there it goes. Fucking hell, that's an earthquake. Yeah. This has not happened on the podcast before. It's a good thing we've got the video on, or I, um, I would have <laughs> just been listening to a, a quiet thumping noise. Okay, I think it's time to again, Matt. I forgot to ask, are you in Taipei? Or are you elsewhere? Yeah, I'm in Taipei. Right. Good thing, right? Um, so every time I have an earthquake, I forget what I was talking about. I think that's that's understandable. Um, the crocodiles in relation oh, to yeah. Xinjiang. So, yeah, I was going to say like the crocodile. Everyone doesn't want to appear like a croc. Like they're worried about being perceived as a crocodile, and that was. Uh, I don't know if it was like a direct reference to Bai Xinjiang, but like Bai Xinjiang didn't come out until much later. Uh being gay so he's writing about crocodiles and i think like the media scrutiny um i certainly have seen within my period of being in taiwan like reports in the newspaper about these gay parties being uncovered and like you see them all photographed like uh with their like their all their legs crossed and they were caught with like I wasn't sure why they were caught exactly, but apparently it's to do with the, the drugs. But when I was early in Taiwan, you would still get this. And you still, when you go to gay clubs here, occasionally the night will be stopped and you'll all get ID'd. Everyone will have to line up outside and show their IDs for what reason is not very clear. But so while Taiwan is quite free in that aspect, it's still, there's still conservative aspects about life here, I think. That's it's, it's a danger, isn't it, to sort of allow, uh, ironically enough, binary thinking to think, okay, so um, there's there's two Chinas, there's Taiwan, and there's the mainland. The mainland is the oppressive place, therefore, Taiwan must be liberal utopia. When like that's you know that's that's a mental trap. That's not attention to to the actual reality on the ground. Yeah. Yep. Um, there was something I was going to mention. <laughs> so I, I'm reading a. Bai Xianyong book just now, Taipei People. And I I noticed like so many of the chapters are about um ladies any of any particular age. And there's a huge amount of description of like their beauty and their clothes and their silk cheap house. And I was thinking, like, oh, this is a strange, quite a strange thing for a, a, a male author to zoom in on so much. Is this like, has he got a fetish for this kind of woman? Um, but yeah, that that sort of answers that question, I suppose. It's um, it's not that sort of a relationship with his characters he would have had, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I think in terms of, uh, if you're going to put Cho Miao Jin in the context of Taiwanese literature, like uh, she's following on from people like Bai Xianyong, but then also later on, well, I think, I'm not sure if uh, Zhu Tianwen's Notes of a Desolate Man was written at the same time, or they were published at some very closely, like Notes of a Desolate Man and Notes of a Crocodile seem to have been published within a year of each other. Mm. But they do seem like kind of almost like book it, like bookends, like they do echo each other a lot. Like Right. Yeah, interesting. And it's nice that their English uh, translated titles match. That's, that's pretty good. Is it that the Chinese titles both end in uh, G? Like Shi Yoji, Journey to the West, is it the same character? Yeah, so it's right. Huang Ren Shouji and E Yu Shouji. So it's show, show as in the hand, and then notes. Right. Yeah, it's um, that's quite a, a nice way to translate it, I guess. Notes of a da 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 da. It's appropriate for the book. Um. So the next section of questions I've got here is reception and interpretation of the work. Um. I think that we've um we've handled this first question pretty heavily about like the context and the importance of the book in Taiwan and Taiwanese lit. But here's one thing we didn't uh, touch on. It's the, like the impact it had on the language. Um, it's just the really basic level that the main character is called Ladzu, or at least that's her nickname. Although that was way less prominent in the book than I think some of the coverage of the book would lead you to believe. It's, uh -huh. we don't hear it until I think past halfway through. It's just the nickname it only pops up a few times. 
but regardless i've read that ladza is now used as like a, a synonym for like lesbian women well yeah what other kind of lesbians are there lesbians in in, in taiwan in taiwanese is i mean is that true am i reading stuff that is true on the ground uh i'm I'm not a lesbian myself, but oh. uh, I have heard it used uh, in 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 reference to lesbians. What I thought was more interesting is that it took it took off in mainland China. Like also in the documentary, they 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 talked about the the reception in mainland China and how, although it was only officially published, I think there in 2012. Apparently, before that, there'd been a, like you were saying before about the power of uh, the web. So that it was spread massively in online circles in mainland China before that, according to a, a mainland lesbian interviewed in the documentary. And so in mainland China, I think there's a lot of references to Lala as being uh, referring to lesbian affairs or lesbians. Yeah, so it does. Uh, it has taken on that a cultural thing. I think Chiu Miao Jin is very. Uh, like highly regarded in lesbian circles as well, even in popular culture, I think. Mm, yeah, um, I remember seeing references to her work that aren't just framing it as like Taiwanese or, or Chinese lit, framing, at least or either, even if it's only in the context of Asian lit, that's sometimes literature translated from Chinese, it doesn't, doesn't get that framing. I'm just looking up right now, um, sorry, go ahead. Ocean, oh sorry, Ocean Vuong, is it Ocean Vuong? Uh, his book, yeah, his book, his recent book had a dedication to Chiu Miao Jin, and he quoted her. He quoted uh, either Notes from Montmartre or Notes for Crocodile, or it's it's or, the Montmartre one. Um, right. And the reason I know that is not because I'm knowledgeable; it's because that came up in my earlier interview today with uh, Chita Wei and Ari Heinrich because. Uh, Montremart, that's Ari's translation. So Tawe mentioned uh, it as a way to sort of big up his translator, I think, as well as uh, to point out the importance of uh, this stuff, not just in an Asian context, but also Asian diaspora, Asian American context. Actually, I really liked, even though Ocean Vuong's book is very similar to this book, I liked Ocean Vuong's book a lot more than than this book. But mm. I've just um, I've just popped um, notes of a crocodile's um, Chinese name into Baidu to see if Baidu will immediately give me <laughs> like a pirate copy of the um, like the e-text. I don't know if I'm seeing that, but yeah, I'm seeing loads of options to like read it online, buy it, discussion about it. It's got a page on Doban. Doban probably be a more interesting thing to look at if I had more time, but better not to do that mid-interview. But yeah, I could I could see it. I could see it being really popular in the mainland for sure. Next question. Um, it's about the book in translation, uh, the reception of the book in translation. Um, so again, this is probably where I went in uh, a little bit too cynical. I did notice that in a few reviews, the reviewer had spelled her name Q-U-I, which, you know, that shouldn't be a death sentence for the reviewer. But my suspicion with Western um, reception of translated Chinese stuff, and I would apply this to myself too, is that we go in looking for something that ticks our own sort of boxes and disregard everything else. And th there's a, a line in the book. Um, I should have, do I have it quoted? I, I, I know the line you're talking about with the, <laughs> yeah. uh, where they're at the bar and they're, they're talking about the gender, that gender. people have no gender. Let's monopolize, let's, um, what is it? Take control of society, start a, oh God, where is it? Oh yeah, so one of the, they're, they're talking about sort of questioning gender and then one says the line, hey, we should found a gender-free society and monopolize all the public restrooms. And that's in almost every English language review of the book. And what have I got? I've got a whole rant written out here. It's it's quite a prophetic line because it it's ahead of its time and it's where some of the sort of debates and discourse is at today, um, questioning gender and finding ways to accommodate for, I guess, non-binary people like gender-free bathrooms. Um, but my, my feeling is, is that's not a really representative of the book. There is sort of interrogation of gender, but from my point of view, it was... Um, more about sort of the 
binary. And then there is really a line, I think, deeper almost where like anything outside the boundary is cast away and, you know, isn't even allowed to exist or have a name. So like the line about having a gender free society, I guess that's that is sort of looking to the solution to the problem of having some kind of existence outside the, the binary. But like I didn't see an awful lot of that in the book. It's quite utopian as well for a book which is generally not very utopian. A book, not not that it's hundred percent pessimistic, but it seemed to me to be more focused on like individuals or couples and relationships, not about groups of people planning to bring about progress in society, which is a nice narrative to read. But I don't really see it in the book. Being a bit mean here, maybe to some of the reviewers, but um, yeah, do you do you? Have any similar misgivings about reception of the book, or do you think it's 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 I'm I'm being overly critical? I mean, I feel like if people are engaging with Taiwanese literature, that's already like like a victory, I guess. That like people are actually reading and people are engaging with it. Uh, it's already a victory. But I get I get your point. Like I wouldn't say that. Like maybe I I say some aspects of the book do show like an idealism, like Mengsheng. As much as he's a negative character, he does show some sensitivity and some ideals and that kind of like that idea of like a genderless and like his sexuality is all over the all over the place. Um, yeah, I get what you mean though. Like, OK, so for some of the novel, I get what your point is. Like the she re- she read a little bit. The main character read a little bit like a, a female version of an incel, like <laughs> It's like, I was gonna say when she was constantly um, leading on other girls and then dumping them, it's like this is for straight men. This is what we call a fuck boy. Like, yeah, yeah. it's basically like I, I felt like a lot of the her ideas of gender were, like you said, a lot more conservative than that particular quote would point out. So she was, yeah. she, although you pointed out those other two couples were. Well, mask for mask, or whatever you want to call it, and the the two more feminine girls. Mm. Her dialectic seemed to be about being a. She goes on constantly about how her masculine, like she feels masculine energy, and that she she goes on about becoming a man. In her other short story, Atomic Hair, there's a lot of uh, disguising as as masculine or becoming a man or pretending to be a man. And I think that she's a lot more conservative in her ideas than maybe Mengsheng is in the novel. So I think there's like a, a spectrum there. So I think there is a, a ta- like a, if you look at the protagonist, not a, this is where we get into trouble completing Chiu Miao Jin with, with the main character because yeah. all of these characters are Chiu Miao Jin doing her work. So there's aspects of her who... She's very self-critical also. So she can see that maybe this is not a healthy way to be, but it doesn't mean that a character will not be stuck in that pattern, continuing to, like, she has like a really, I thought it was like a very apt, her advice for Shiro or for Tun Tun about love. Let me see if I can find it here. Uh, sorry, I'll be two seconds. All right. She says, only healthy people are capable of being in love. Using love to treat an illness just makes the illness even worse. And so she gives that advice to Tun Tun, I think it is. But yet within the novel, the protagonist is constantly doing what she says not to do. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that's exactly why she knows it doesn't work. Speaking of like the the character being aware of her flaws, but indulging in them anyway, and maybe admitting or owning up or just giving representation to sort of more old school ideas about um, men, women, gender, and so on. Um, So here's a line from from the narrator uh, early in the book. She says, in the past, I believe that every man had his own innate prototype of a woman and that he would fall in love with the woman who most resembled his type. Although I'm a woman, I have a female prototype too. And then skipping forward slightly. My type would appear in hallucinations just as you were freezing to death. 
atop an icy mountain, a legendary beauty from the furthest regions, reaches of fantasy. For four years, that's what I believed, and I wasted all my college days when I had the most courage and honesty I would ever have towards life because of it. And that's one of the bits where I was like, oh, damn, <laughs> it's me. It's like I'm reading my past self's self-reflections. Well, yeah, like it's um, it's it's a far cry from the line about gender-free bathrooms, but I think it's, it fits into the the context of like what is representative about the book, and maybe that kind of sentiment is more representative of the book than uh, a speculation about gender-free bathrooms. But I think, to be fair, the there is a lot of gender play in Cho Miao Jin's work, so you can see why that kind of line would stand out to to reviewers for sure and i mean i've i've written copy and promo and reviews before as well and it's like yeah what are you going to do spend paragraphs going over the complicated sometimes progressive sometimes conservative nuances or are you going to catch the reader's attention with something equally valid and much snappier like it's just, it's perfectly right. valid yeah um so right okay um my next question it's if you have any sort of um not necessarily an orthodox takes, but do you have any takes on the book that you've not seen anywhere else? Or you maybe heard it voiced, but haven't seen it sort of out there accessible in media? I mean, I guess you've already said you found the name dropping a bit annoying. I don't know if I'd seen that. And I had seen people say they found it annoying because of the overblownness, but I don't know. Is there anything else positive or negative? Like, I, I would say that the thing I, I find frustrating about the book is uh, her, I don't know, like, the lack of progression of the character. And you see her go through the same cycle and you want her to learn from her past or you want her to, like, the bit that really annoyed me, like, so much so that I think I was listening to the, the audio of the book and I, like, I stopped and replayed it like was the bit where she left Xiaofan at the hospital after when Xiaofan is suffering from like liver failure or something. And I just thought like an interesting aspect of her is that she is trying to be cruel and trying to be, she, she says it like, uh, she says it. Uh, oh, I think I know that, but you mean. Explicitly, cruelty and mercy are one and the same. And then existence in this world relegates good and evil to the exact same status and she wants to be cruel or she is constantly trying to make herself more cruel and I thought that related in the way to crocodiles in that when we think of crocodiles not in the book specifically as they're mentioned because they seem quite cute in the book or like eating pop pastries but what I thought was weird was like she's there's a lot of references to animals in the book mm. and becoming an animal and I think that the idea of the crocodile being cruel, she was constantly, seems to be pushing herself to be an awful person. And it almost mm. seemed like reverse, like, you know, when you're trying to make yourself better and you're, you're uh, giving yourself like, I should be a nicer person, this person. It was almost, she had guilt for being nice to Shailene. She mm. had, and whenever she showed a, what the reader might, convey as a positive quality she would go oh I, I was weak and I let this like I I was nice to and I know it's part of the earlier I talked about the logic that you have when you're under this repressive when you're repressing something about yourself your logic can get twisted up but I didn't really get why we were supposed to oh, even if we were to empathize with this character yeah uh, and then if she's pushing herself to be crueler and more like a crocodile I guess and then yeah. the crocodiles are more human. And there's a reference in the crocodile bit about whether it's a human, is a crocodile a human-looking crocodile or a crocodile-looking human or something. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was a bit of play with the idea that she, the main character, is more of an animal than the crocodile is an animal who is masquerading as human. But There was a thing I noticed um, that a lot of the references to animals were similar animals to crocodiles uh, lizards and i was wondering like why why are we kind of being a little bit more broad lizards and crocodiles and i think an answer might have occurred to me just now that they're all cold-blooded 
pretty sure cro- crocodiles yeah. are cold blooded anyway. And yeah, she she knows she's got this I don't know uh, romantic side to her, um, but really wishes she could correct it with a little cruelty and cold bloodedness. And like as uh, kind of maybe narratively frustrating as it is, I know in myself I have this problem. I have certain tendencies. I know rationally how I could correct them, and I can rationally sort of counter. Uh, yeah, correct in the other direction or neuter those tendencies consciously, but you can never consciously monitor yourself forever. And unless your habits change over a longer term, a longer, like a gradual change, then the sort of stupid, stupid or destructive or irrational things you do, or I've done, have often come back and repeated. And they've only gone away, yeah, gradually over time. Um, and I like my feeling from the book was, yeah, uh, lads, it does sort of slowly change, but it's like three steps forward, two steps back. And yeah, I mean, whether or not it makes a good book, I don't know, but it felt believable to me. Um, the other thing, I'm not sure, I, this is kind of just not related to what the last point, I, but I know this, this down earlier, the advice that she gives to um, Jero, I think it was, um, about like even love not really being the answer. I thought this was pretty insightful um but then again this is coming from me like a straight person who's not gone through the things that um the characters in the story have but she says like okay so you're you have repressed desires and you think that being able to express them will solve all your problems well i have bad news for you you can never actually fill that hole it'll just lead to obsessions and you'll chase something and you'll you yeah you you might solve your initial problem but that it doesn't end there there's new, possibly even more extreme problems further down the road. And I mean, I won't, I won't go into lots of personal details, but yeah, like coming out my shell, coming out, I mean, if you come out your shell, you're exposing yourself to the world. And if you start becoming more proactive, you could be throwing yourself into, you know, all the problems life throws right back at you. So without trying to like frame that as a positive or a negative thing i was like damn that's really true and the other thing i think i've not said about the book enough yet is i thought it was in at least in translation i'm sure it's the same for original i thought it was really quite beautifully written just as a piece of prose this is one of the best books i've done on the podcast and i was stupid that i've not said that yet but yeah i thought it was uh, i'll stop repeating myself but uh, yeah i can't i can't say that strongly enough that um just as a piece of literature i found the book pretty beautiful and not always insightful and deep, but often, often spoke a lot to me. That's not really, a, not really giving you a question there, have I? Um, no, no, I, I'm not saying that. I just like, uh, I guess that maybe there's something in me that I am uncomfortable with. And I see that in Laza. So I, I still had a, like objectively, I could see that it is, uh, it's a good book, but subjectively, I guess something in it, made me hate the protagonist and I'm not sure if that was intentional or not like on her part but like I guess the part of you that goes through those things you don't want to face the despair side or you don't want to go towards that and if you especially if you're LGBT you get a lot like all through growing up the representations of the character gets AIDS and dies the character gets AIDS and dies the character is depressed and dies the character is arrested or I mean like where you you have this like trope of falling in love with straight people and like it being a constantly unable to achieve unrealistic like there was a a show in uh, the UK aired a few years ago called Cucumber where one of the characters falls in love with a straight guy and then gets like killed but like that's a very fairly prominent trope in in LGBT so for to be fair to Cho Miao Jin, this is an early, early piece. So the despair is is warranted. But if you if you get too much of that a lot, then you get a bit, it feels a bit cliched, even though it was before the cliches. It, it was before it was cliched. Right. Yeah, I, I can see that where it's like, it's all the more frustrating where it's, you see where this person is coming from, or you can empathize, but then they they don't course correct or they take the wrong conclusions. Like another piece of translated Chinese lit I've read is two books by Murong Shui Sun. And these are, these, this is like a uh, toxic masculinity, the novel, um, both of them, um, but dealing with sort of corruption in China. One of them 
the main character is um what is he he's in like a state owned enterprise it's like the oil biz so it's all about money and then the other one uh, dancing through red dust he's uh, a lawyer so it's the same thing it's a completely corrupt business in china because every at least in the novel everything is decided beforehand and you just cash in and um in both books just the guy he just womanizes he drinks he eats he lies um he occasionally feels guilt and the thing driving the plot is him trying to get away with everything and the thing that makes it interesting in translation is that it's edgy stuff that exposes the, the dark side of china and like the first one where he's he's his character is like i would say very muddied rather than totally black hearted it's like yeah i've um i've been a bit of an asset i see where this guy's coming from i can um i can see the guilt there but like this is really exaggerated and crazy i'm glad this book isn't too long um okay i can take it it was quite fun read but then the second one it's like longer it's way darker way more intense um the character has mm, he does worse things he's got far less fruit there's less of a human there to attach to so again it's like okay i can see these horrible tendencies the seed of these horrible tendencies inside myself the greed the selfishness but it's like come on man give me something to hold on to and yeah. like, the fact it's the second book as well that like he just keeps repeating this pattern in his fiction it's like fucking hell i i can't be 100 percent on board with this it's uh it's too, it's too depressing even for me and it's not depressing because of the content it's depressing because yeah there's um it's just pure indulgence. I'm not saying that Choma Jin's doing pure indulgence, but yeah, the indulgence in like toxic stuff or stuff with a toxic spin to it. I can see why that would be alienating. And then even more so if it's something that you've seen over and over and over and over and over and over and over across multiple authors and medium. Well, yeah, it's just like I think like a lot of the message of uh like there was recent like recently in the the gay community, there was the it gets better uh campaign to try and tell young people that oh, whatever you're going through now in the future it'll get better for you like you'll be able to live your life and it's just sad that like for like because you wonder like yeah would it have gotten better for Cho Miao Jin if she had not stabbed herself but yeah it's just a it's just like a frustrating thing and I guess you just have to separate it from your reading of the novel because yeah, yeah it's not within the, the bounds of it but yeah yeah for sure yeah i'm like i'm reading it from a very sort of um safe seat here although like i don't know even like the difference between um the world now and what it was like when i was in high school it i think it died off a bit towards the end of my time in school but like the first couple years in the middle of my time in high school um it was just normal anything you didn't like just call it gay um it must have been for for actually like gay lads who uh, there was one there was one guy who was in my reggie class all through high school who did come out um but i'm really not surprised he didn't come out until high school in in this well in the last decade because bloody hell it was um a lot's changed just in like 10 years in the uk yeah. for sure. things did get better i suppose on that slightly heavy note i'm gonna move on to some silly questions if, if that's yeah. all right okay so first silly question um Chinese the Chinese word of the day um do you think there's a good sort of word or character we could use to represent the story I had a I had a a fun one that I found uh it's like a very popular Taiwanese one that's still used like today like uh samba as in three it right so she uses it talking about I think it's either judo or or tonton uh she says like that, she'll talk a lot of samba hua. Samba, samba means like when someone's, uh, wait, I have a definition here. Uh, when someone's like, it can be hot headed or like reckless, but it's normally talked about girls, like when they're frivolous or like a giddy girl mm. or like uh, gossipy. It can mean a, a million different things though. Like if you try to use it, a Taiwanese person will have a different definition of what they think it means. So yeah. they can say, like, it can, some people think it means like bitchy. Some people think, think it means like, uh, like superficial and like uh, a bit silly, I guess, ditzy as well as another one. That's a good one. Yeah. I've just Googled it and I've found a Chinese language forum. Uh, it's got 
a whole quite complicated top reply here. Taiwanese like to use the word samba to describe female behavior bordering on craziness, such as frivolous actions or doing reckless things. It appears that the word originates from the Cantonese or Minnan dialect, but in reality, it is not. In fact, samba, samba is the authentic Central Plains vocabulary. And um, there's even a citation all the way back to a, some word, jangba, which was a word for prostitute from the north during the Song dynasty. Dynasty. So, yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> so apparently, quite an old one. Interesting one. Yeah. But it's like it's a very very common in Taiwan. Taiwan, like Nihon Sambai, like they always be saying that. But... Okay, yeah. I should remember that one because those are two really, really, really easy characters to read and to to remember. Um, yeah. yeah, numbers, number Chinese. That's that was like. The most useful vocab my first year in China was just the numbers, because <laughs> like um, ordering a fries at the KFC, it'd be like uh, the eighteen Kwai one, please. <laughs> Total laziness. Um, anyway, uh, next silly question: uh, If notes of a crocodile was a drink, what would it be? And um, cocktails that are a quirky mix of everything and really strong coffees are are banned because those have been grossly overused. So, aside from those two, do you have anything? Oh, I just, I didn't read the last line, uh, but when oh. I, I formulated my answer, but uh, there's a bar in Taiwan called Hunt, oh no, called Commander Daisy, and they have a drink called Baby Sleeps Three Nights, <laughs> and it's it's like a it's the kind of drink where you have one, and then you kind of lose your memory of the rest of the night, and then you wake up probably still in the bar or in the toilet of the bar. And have to say goodbye to the bar staff in the morning. Uh, it's like a very strong drink, but it's like emotionally draining. Right. Okay, there you go. Perfect. Like a horrible hangover would be like the whole next day, you'll just be hungover. Yeah. And you'd be questioning. That's kind, of, that's kind of a cocktail mix of everything which you put in your band. I think I think that qualifies. Um, there was one that was big when I was an undergraduate, appropriately enough, given this is an undergrad sort of novel. Um in Manchester, and I don't know if this was a Manchester thing or a 2012 thing. It was called a zombie. Have you heard of that? Mm, sounds vaguely familiar. It was like you drink more than one and then you become a zombie. So there were tiki bars were a popular hipster thing in Manchester at that time, and they all did zombies. And it sounds like it might be a cousin of the baby sleeps for three nights. Uh, yeah, maybe. Um, okay, last silly question. Um, it's not really silly. It's self promo slot so we there was your blog um can you give us the url for that one more time uh, translating taiwan.com okay cool um is there anything else you'd like to self promote uh you can just uh, check out on twitter uh at laden frame l a d e n f r a m e okay cool um and last couple of questions before we go our separate ways, um, some intertextuality. So if our listeners want more of anything similar to Notes of a Crocodile, where would you direct them? I'm going to have to say um, myself here. If you're, uh, if you read Chinese, there's a good book that's just been published called Amada Nipunyo or Grandma's Girlfriends. And it's about older generations, lesbians. So, uh, it, it takes like a, a lot of people who are old ladies now and interviews them about their past. And some of them have been married and divorced. Some of them are like uh, have been undercover. Some of them were more uh, what we call butch. Some of them were more femme. Uh, it's a companion book to another book about older generation gays that came out a few years ago. I'd also recommend... There's a podcast if you want to practice your Chinese as well. Uh, there's a podcast called Wet Boy Podcast. It's Run Nan. Uh, and it, it, he's quite good. He focuses on gay issues and talks about a lot of uh, modern uh, gay cultural stuff, which is quite interesting. And yeah. All right, cool. Um, recommended. Yeah, I've got a couple. Um, so I, I did this last time around, um, Tawe and Ari recommending all this great queer literature. And then I was like, here's my straight books that I'll recommend. So I'll do that again. Um, we mentioned No Longer Human by Osamu Desai quite a few times. And like, 
if you if listeners if you want to read something um about a painfully self-aware um individual alienated individual um that's short and very readable bingo uh that that's a really that's a great book um also i guess also sort of um transgressive in various ways it's not it's not a nice pc book but it's also not anything that would switch you off unless you're really squeamish i think and then another one um this is this is a book that is quite appropriate i think just personally uh, an author who's who captures like the sort of painfully self-conscious younger person trying to come to terms with like their desires and in this case the opposite sex but that doesn't matter so much just that whoever you happen to be attracted to being attracted to people is Alistair Gray. He's a, he's a really great Scottish author. He passed away just a couple of years ago. Um, he was a Glaswegian and actually he's got two books that would both be really great recommendations. Um, one is called um, Poor Things and it's actually getting a film adaptation um, is, in, is in the works. That's a, it's a retelling of Frankenstein uh, yeah, I'm probably less well placed to summarize that one because I've only read it the once. But the other, his other book, his masterpiece, Lanark, uh, A Life in Four Books, it's huge. So it's not as small as Notes of a Crocodile, but you deal with these two parallel lives of these alienated men. One lives in a fantasy, Glasgow. One lives in real sort of wartime and then post-war Glasgow. And he, especially the, re- the realist one, he, so he starts off in school, growing up as a boy. So it's got a sort of James Joyce um, uh, portrait of an artist as a young man sort of vibe to it, um, which a bit like that book, it's not as unreadable as the later Joyce stuff. It's got a fairly, the building's run up roman development of an individual sort of narrative. And so again, a bit, of, a bit more of a linear progression than Notes of a Crocodile, just because he's literally growing up. He's at least physically getting bigger. And then the second part of the realist section of the novel, he's in art school. So he's trying to figure himself out both as a, a erotic individual and as an artistic individual, to use some fancy words. Um, but he's got the similar pathology to Lazza in that he gets very stuck onto his twisted self-destructive logic and sort of rides that train um, down often the wrong path. Um, and, and if you've done that yourself as a, as a teenager or a 20-something or even any time in your life, probably relate to it. So, yeah, I really recommend Lanark, but it's, it's, it's big. It's a big book. Last question. What are you reading just now? Uh, I'm reading. Uh, there's a professor at NTU called Michelle Huang. She researches uh, geography. Uh, she's got a book called Zhonggang uh, Shinganju, like new feelings between... China and Hong Kong. Mm. It's it deals with the relations between Taiwan, China, and Hong Kong through the medium of popular film and popular novels. So she looks at contemporary literature and sees the themes and how it develops between, for example, Hong Kong used to see itself as the more developed of between China and Hong Kong. But now that has shifted and the dynamic now in popular literature is that Hong Kong is lagging behind and is looking to uh, go to China to develop to develop or to bring development. But it's very interesting so far. Uh, it's actually brought up a lot of uh, good films right. that uh, people can people can go and watch as well. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, well, my what are you reading just now is going to be a bit dull for listeners because I'm recording this the same day I recorded The Membranes. So I'm, ov- I'm obviously reading the same book. I didn't happen to finish that book and start my next one in the two hours between these two calls, uh, but it's Taipei People by, by Xian Yong. Um, oh, yeah. But now, now I'll be reading it knowing that he was a gay man. So that sort of reframes things. I mean, better late than never. I'm like 80% of the way through the book, but yeah, I think like for me, I didn't enjoy Taipei people as much as uh, Crystal Boys. Mm. But I think maybe yeah, a lot of people think that Taipei people is a better literary work. But I feel like Crystal Boys was more enjoyable. Mm. I did notice one of the sh- I wasn't sure if Crystal Boys was a short story because one of the Taipei people shorts that I just finished 
either most recently or second most recently, uh, there's a character, I think he's an older man who frequents a park. It might be that same park. And it's sort of in the background, yeah, there are these boys who are, uh, I guess, yeah, um, getting picked up or picking each other up or something. And I didn't really know what to make of it. I didn't know how to fit that into the, the context or if that was a real thing in Taiwan at the time. But I guess now I know. So, yeah. Uh-huh. All right. That's all my questions. So I think I'll I'll draw the interview to a close. But before I do, is there anything we've not said that we've missed that you think we ought to close on or do you think we're all good? I think, I think we're okay. Yeah, I think so too. I don't say I'm, I'm glad you didn't get buried by an earthquake midway through the call. That's, that's encouraging. I hope that maybe like uh, people can, if they want to, Reach if they want a more expert opinion on the the stuff as well, they can reach out to Ji Dawei or like he he knows a lot. He's got Twitter, I think. He has a yeah. lot more knowledge in this area than than I do. But. Yeah, and I actually asked him when we were doing this segment of the show as like self promo slot. He he named his Instagram, his Twitter, and I was like, "So do you, is are you open to just listeners of the show just quizzing you?" And he's like, "Yeah." Yeah, new friends. So <laughs> I second what you just said there. Da-da. That's the end of the show. So just the plugs to go now. I don't really have anything spectacular prepared. Just um, social media. It's it's the usual. Instagram, Twitter, and Discord. Instagram is at truechufic, T-R-C-H-F-I-C. Twitter is uh, it's just myself, at Angus Likes Words. There's a link to join the show's Discord in the show notes at the bottom. Yeah, I mean, if you want to f- give feedback on the episode, then Twitter and IG are fun places to do that, to like just speak to me directly. Also to keep up with um, things I'm talking about on social media or updates about the show, obviously. If you'd like to give some more collective feedback uh, that'll reach other fans, Discord is where you want to go. That's all I've got to say, really. Um, to support the show tangibly, which means with money. Um, There is a support page on the show's homepage, which is at trchfic, T-R-C-H-F-I-C, T-R-C-H-F-I-C dot podbean dot com. And there's a support page on there um, where you can find all the ways you can support the show. Uh, Best one's probably Patreon, because that will get you access to a gazillion billion bonus shows, all averaging probably about half an hour long. Some shorter, some even longer. I think most recently we've had some bonus episodes up on actually Notes of a Crocodile. That just went up uh, the day before, a couple days before recording this one, I believe. Also two episodes on Wang Shuo's uh, Playing for... Yes, Playing for Thrills. Yes, that one. And there's more more lined up, um, some like auxiliary episodes on books that are going to be covered in this Taiwan season. And other stuff that will probably never be done on the show because it's not fiction or it's not translated or if it is translated it's not from Chinese. I did a non-fiction book translated from uh, German to English, uh, Shanghai by uh, Byung Cho Han, the German, Korean, Swiss, maybe I didn't order those correctly, um, social, sorry not social theorist, cultural theorist. So yeah there's some really out there stuff on the Patreon, blah blah blah, support the show. Um, you know, you, you know the deal. But of course, you'll probably also know what I'm going to say next. Uh, and that is the best way to support the show it has nothing to do with uh, social media or indeed with money. It's about spreading the word. So if you know anybody, it could be a teacher, a friend, an online entity, a crocodile at the bottom of a swamp, anyone at all that might enjoy the show, just tell them about it. I think that's the best thing you can do, you know. And even if they don't take up your suggestion, at least you'll have had a conversation, a precious thing in this sad and lonely world. So until the next episode, Sai Jian. <laughs>